Let me pray and get us, get us started here. Father, thank you for, uh, again, uh, an evening of looking into your creation, Father, uh, the magnificence of it. Just we pray again that you'd open our eyes that we might see wondrous things, not only from your word, but from uh, your creation itself, Father. And uh, be with us this evening, be with this church. Thank you for our church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we're going to finish up our uh, topic of studying the life sciences, biological evolution. How did life get started even tonight is how we're going to do that. Uh, last two weeks we've been looking at Darwinian evolution and how that doesn't explain the production of complex systems, how um, the structures of these complex systems, irreducibly complex systems, uh, couldn't have come about by uh, random chance and by random mutations, where each successive stage during this supposed evolution of this, the eye, for example, could have come about by uh, random chance. The, st the, inter the inter intermediate uh, transitional forms wouldn't have been survivable. And so uh, if Darwinian evolution is true, we'd expect to find this finely graded evidence of transitional forms in the fossil record. And indeed, we don't find that uh, at all. But what do we find in the fossil record? We find a layer of uh, critters and animals and things like that uh, that appear in sudden uh, vast quantities, in vast different uh, varieties of animals that we see buried in this layer. Um, and then we call it the Cambrian explosion of life on this earth. Uh, and then after that, you see all the same creatures in stasis and the different layers and so forth of the geological record. And so what model does that fit? Yeah, it fits a creation model. It's just like God created and then, you know, it all started dying off from there. It also fits a flood model. Uh, Ken Ham used to say uh, to the kids who take some of his uh, courses and so forth, he'd say, now, repeat this after me, millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth by vast quantities of water. That's not how he said it. I forget. Now I can't even remember it myself. Uh, but anyway, millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth uh, flooded by water. And of course, there's a, an example of the flood right there. Every time you drive through a rock cut uh, in the uh, mountains, uh, you see the evidence of a geologic flood right there. So we'll be looking at some of that information there. Um, but of course, God said in uh, Genesis 1:24, "Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and every beast of the earth, each according to its kind." In other words, we don't go outside of the kind. You don't you, within the kind. We can have all kinds of different variety, but you don't go from, you know, canines to cows. You don't go from uh, cats to uh, humans. You don't uh, you don't cross kinds because God put a limit on those things. Also last week we talked about the mousetrap. Remember that? Irreducible complexity. The five different parts of the mousetrap. Well here's another mousetrap. It's called the bacterial flagellum. Now this is just a single celled bacteria or animal we might call it. And uh, you can see the outline of the cell right here in the inside with the nucleus and everything. But what's interesting about this is this tail right here. And this tail is called a flagellum. It's what's used to propel uh, this uh, little critter uh, around. And uh, so let's take a look at this tail. Matter of fact, this next slide shows the tail how it works. It's wagging. I mean, it's, it's got a, uh, a whip-like motion on it. And so, uh, but notice uh, what's going on here at the bottom. It kind of looks like a motor, a little nano motor right there. Could that possibly be that way? Well, surely it's not like a regular electric motor because a regular electric motor has a stator. That's the outside stationary field in orange right there. That's the stator. It establishes that changing magnetic field. And then it's got a rotor, which is the thing that turns around on the inside, which also has a magnetic field, which reacts with the stator. And then it's got a bearing right here, which the whole thing rides on and so forth. So all those, those are the kind of things that you'd expect to find in a motor that's been designed. But take a look at the bacterial flagellum. This thing right down here, they call it a rotor right here. And inside, there's some proteins that go around the outside of this thing, and they call that the stator. And then right here through the cell wall where that little filament comes out, the little propeller or whatever it is, they've got this little set of proteins right here, and they call that a bushing or a bearing. It's got all the same components of a regular motor right here. Now, all this is supposed to have come about by random chance. Uh, excuse me, I don't, I don't think that could possibly be that way. It's much more designed than that. 
But tonight, we're not talking about so much the evolution of life and how uh, it's impossible to have, to have happened like that. We want to talk about the origin of life. How do you go from rocks to life, to a single-celled animal? And of course, many people today, uh, uh, not just today, but in the past, have believed in a gods of wood and stone, right? I mean, they used to worship these idols and so forth. They'd make these idols. And of course, that was insulting to our God, right? To, for other people to make idols and images like that. God even said, don't make images unto me. Uh, but, you know, you can almost say, well, I'm thankful that society is not like that today, that they don't make gods of wood and stone, at least not in the civilized uh, societies that we have. But you know what? Our society has created a God that's far worse than you know, those gods of wood and stone, far more insulting to God. It's called the God of random chance. Uh, you know, it's almost better to believe, even mistakenly, that, that God is some sort of, you know, idol out here or whatever, uh, because then, then you at least believe that there is a God. But the God of random chance says, I don't believe there is a God at all. And so how insulting could that be to our God? But first, um, what we want to do is examine the idea that if, there, if it's all supposed to have come about by chance, how do you get life started in the first place? And uh, chance implies betting, doesn't it? I mean, it implies some sort of uh, rolling the dice and so forth. And if we were going to uh, roll the dice down in Tunica, we'd ought to study those games a little bit before we roll that dice and, and see what the odds are. Kind of uh, before we place our bet, we'd want to study that horse over at the racetrack, right? So we're going to do that a little bit tonight before we place our bet on this idea of random chance being the start of it all. So now, by the way, every living cell that's on this earth today came from a previous living cell, right? Either it's parents or it's grandparents, or the embryo or the egg. It all goes back to previous life, uh, every living thing. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way back to the first life on this earth. It came about by cell division, this process that's called cell division. And how far can you take that back? Well, all the way back. Uh, but it begs the question, how did that first cell come about, if it all came about by random chance, right? So before we can compute the odds uh, of that, we have to kind of look at what a cell is made out of. Now, it used to be that 100 years ago, they thought that a cell is a simple homogulous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. Now, does anybody know what that sentence means? bunch of stuff, yeah, jello, right? <laughs> Basically, they just, they didn't know what was in a cell. They just thought it was just a blob of goo, right? You know, and that was a cell. But uh, there's, we know a lot more than that today. As a matter of fact, we know that cells are made up of nucleuses and uh, have DNA and chromosomes and genes and so forth inside these cells and proteins and all sorts of uh, things inside the cell. So here's a picture of a cell you can see the outside membrane of the cell and the nucleus on the inside right here and the little things inside the nucleus are little chromosomes. And so I'm gonna take this one little chromosome and exp expand it out, so here it is expanded out. But if you look even closely, more closely at that chromosome, you can see that it's a wadded up coil right here. And so you see the coil unwinding right here. But then if you look closer at that coil, you see that it's also a coil unwinding right here. And closer again, you see it's another coil unwinding with these little things called histones. And each one of these histones is just a wad of more strands that themselves are this little spiral ladder shaped thing called the double helix. And the double helix has these little individual base pairs down here. And so that's the DNA all wadded up like that. Now, just to give you an idea about what goes on in this cell right here, uh, let me illustrate uh, this with a basketball. And uh, we're going to play a little game here as if we, this basketball was the nucleus of that cell. So that darker part right there, that's, let's let the basketball represent that. And we got to stuff a bunch of DNA inside of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to let monofilament fishing line, about 125 miles of it, represent the DNA that we're going to stuff down into this basketball. So I'll cut a slit into it and I'll start stuffing it in there. How long do you think it'd take me to stuff 125 miles in there? Pretty long time. Uh, it would be kind of a boring job, but uh, we'll, we'll stick it out here. And then uh, the next thing we need to do is pull it all back out, find a single segment of it about seven feet long, and then make a copy of it and stuff it all back in. Okay, But we need to do that about 
mm, 10 times in the next eight hours, okay? And we need to do it without it all getting tangled up so it doesn't make a big mess again. I don't know about you, but I've tried bait casting before with these open reel rods, you know, and, and all I do is make a spaghetti mess, bird's nest out of that thing every time. Uh, that'd be kind of hard to do, but that's exactly what goes on inside of a cell uh, all the time, the part of cell division and copy and so forth. We'll take a, that, a look at that a little bit closer uh, as we move on here, but a cell is made up of atoms. You know what an atom is, the hydrogen atom, the carbon atom, the oxygen atom, the nitrogen atom, all these different atoms. That's the basic unit of matter that we know about. And of course, atoms uh, get put together in a bonding sort of uh, way uh, called covalent bonding, and they go into molecules. And so H2O would be uh, two hydrogen, one oxygen atom, making a uh, water molecule. So this specific arrangement of uh, mo atoms make molecules, and then uh, you can put molecules together in different ways to make amino acids. Amino acids are a building block of proteins Proteins are critical to our bodies. That's what our body is made up out of. All the different parts of our body use proteins. Uh, and that's just an arrangement of amino acids into a shape. And then, of course, uh, DNA um, is part of that cell. DNA is the code that specifies how to build a protein. And so DNA and proteins work together uh, there. And then finally, the cell itself, which is the smallest unit of a living organism. You cannot go smaller than a living cell because you have to have all those parts of the cell in order for it to be alive like that. So somehow or another, we've got to build a cell. We're going to try to build it by chance, okay? Uh, but how is a copy made? Because once you get a cell built, you've got to make copies of it and so forth. Now, this is the nucleic alphabet. Uh, you've got A, T, G, and C. Each one of these things would be the letters of that alphabet. A stands for adenine, T thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And uh, make up the, those, these are actually the nucleotide pairs uh, that go into the DNA. And notice how the A has a little shape on the rounded out shape like this, and the T has a rounded, a concave shape on the end of it, so convex can fit into the concave. And so an A and a T fit together just right. Uh, but it's also the same thing of a G and a C. A G has a little pointy outy shape, that's a technical term, and uh, the C has a little pointy any shape and they can, can fit together like that. And uh, only an A ever fits with a T and only a G ever fits with a C. They don't, a G won't go with an A. It just, it won't happen like that. And so this is uh, gonna play an important role into this uh, uh, DNA in just a moment as we'll see. These are the uh, nucleic codes, the codons, uh, which are taken three at a time. So you take these letters of this DNA alphabet, the nucleotides, take them three at a time, and that makes a word. Each three spells some different word, and that word tells you what kind of amino acid it specifies. So each word equals some amino acid. There's like 20 different amino acids. They're all uh, up here. Uh, leucine, ilocene, valine, uh, threonine, alanine, proline, serine, tyrosine, histidine, I don't know, all these different enes are different amino acids, and uh, each one of this sequence of letters in this DNA specifies that exact uh, amino acid right there. And uh, also interesting, some of these specify not an amino acid, but punctuation in this uh, alpha or this uh, language. Remember we talked about languages the first night? Well, here's punctuation in that language, a start code and a stop code. There's the start code. Genes always start with this. They always do. And they can either stop with these two codes or this one over here. So either one of, the, uh, either one of those uh, will involve the punctuation. And now that you have the words, the sentences become the proteins themselves. And the proteins all get to put together and make a book and you are that book. That book specifies how to build you and me. And uh, so there's the language that specifies life, and it works that same way for all of life. Even a fern, a frog, or a fool like us would be made out of the same kind of uh, DNA right here. And so uh, I just thought that up, fern, frog, and fool. That's pretty good. Right? <laughs> I was trying to think of another F, and that was the first one I came up with. But uh, anyway, um, and of course there's redundancy built into this code. Some of them, there's there are more than one uh, four different uh, uh, codons will specify the same amino acid right here. And so there's redundancy built into the code. 
uh, and they expect that the uh, DNA is even far more complicated than we can even imagine. This is just what we know about it uh, by studying it up to this day. Um, now, I want to show you what DNA replication is all about. The, uh, the DNA is an intrinsically self-replicating molecule uh, because you've got to make a copy of the DNA. Every time you split a cell, you've got to have exact copies of the DNA in this cell and in this cell. They've got to be both the same. So every cell in your body has exactly the same DNA in it. Some of it's not used for whatever that cell is used for, but it's, I mean, they all have the same blueprints. They just make copies of the blueprints all the way down in every cell. So you've got to replicate this stuff all the time. And you can see these are the runs of the ladder of the DNA right here. So an A goes to the T, the G goes to the C, and this sequence right here, each one of them taken three at a time would specify a particular amino acid uh, down through here. And uh, so you see how they all fit together in this thing. And, and then eventually this thing uh, will split down the middle and uh, with a, uh, we'll look at another slide that'll show what, what, what the molecule does that does this splitting right here. But you notice that you can always tell one side from the other side of the template. All you need is one side of the template to be able to put both hands together because you can only put, I mean, if this is an A right here, what goes with an A? Well, it's got to be a G. And so I know that a G is the only thing that can fit on that. And once I've put the only things that fit on there, I've got an exact copy of everything because of the way, the ingenious way that that's put together. It doesn't work, by the way, to call something that happens by random chance that's purposeless, mindless, and purely material ingenious, does it? Ingenious is not a good adjective to describe something like that, but it is. And so that's a clue uh, as to what we're dealing with here um, in a creator. Uh, but these little nucleotides will fit onto these uh, rungs the split part of this DNA right here, and now I have an exact copy. This part of the DNA exactly matches this part of the DNA, and half of it is the old part, and half of it is the new part on each different side, and then uh, it will use that like that. So, uh, now the important thing about this type of chemistry, this is called organic chemistry. Uh, in regular chemistry, it's ever how many electrons are in the outer shell of the atom, that specifies how they bond up together. That's called uh, valence electrons, electromagnetic attractions. But the reason these things attract each other in this case is because of their shapes. The shapes attract each other, and there's this little real uh, lightweight hydrogen bond, which makes it easy to split this thing, unzip it, and zip it back up, uh, that put, th put that together. So, and by the way, it takes less than one hour to replicate. Uh, the, there's a, uh, about, what is it, six trillion pairs in a human DNA or something like that. It takes about one hour for it to replicate itself because it works on multiple parts of it all at the same time like that. And so it's kind of incredible that you can do that or that the, our bodies can do that. It, it makes me feel tired thinking about all that stuff. But <laughs> it's a good thing I don't have to think about it. Okay, uh, here's, the, here's a process called protein synthesis down here or transcription. Uh, now, let me give you this diagram. This is the outside of the nucleus of the cell right here. And you see these gaps every now and then. So this is kind of a, a, a cutaway drawing of the inside of the cell. This is the outside of the nucleus still inside the cell, though. All this business out here called the cytoplasm out here. And here's the DNA. You see the double helix? And this little thing called a polymerase is the zipper. And it unzips the DNA, straight, straightens it out. The red part is the DNA. And then these little free RNA nucleotides floating around here get snapped onto this zipper so that I get this blue piece right here, which is what's called RNA. Now, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA is just simply the ribonucleic acid. And this little blue set of RNA slips out through this hole, and here it is out here. And then this thing called a ribosome finds these little... Uh, amino acids floating around out here and chains them all together to make a protein molecule or a polypeptide chain is what it's called there. But those are the proteins and we'll see how important proteins are in just a minute. But uh, there, there's nothing, uh, remember how we talked about things can happen by law or they can happen by uh, necessity uh, or they can happen um, by design. Okay, there's no law or necessity that says a cell has to work this way. There's nothing that causes these DNA molecules to bind together in the way that they do, chemically speaking. 
Uh, they just do that. And uh, it, it doesn't matter that an A follows a T, that follows a G, follows a C, and so forth. They can come in any different order right here. Whatever the order is specifies a different protein. And each one of you, I mean, a hair cell is different from a muscle cell, is different from skin cells, and so forth. They all are very different proteins. Um, uh, the, the point of all that is, 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 is to say that you can't blame this on natural chemistry. It had to be some sort of design that says these proteins get put together like they do. And uh, let, me, let me give you an illustration. You got a refrigerator at home and you know, you, you've seen these magnet, magnet letters, you know, which you can spell words, you know, in your refrigerator and so forth. Kids like to play with those and so forth. Well, there's nothing about that letter sequence on that refrigerator that says the C should be followed by an A, should be followed by a T, which spells cat, all right? There's nothing that the A and the C want to hold together. There is something that the magnet holds against the refrigerator. There's a, a, an attraction there. So the way these little um, uh, nucleotides bind into a rail of this ladder right here, now that's a chemical attraction the way they bind to the rail right here. But what causes them to be in a certain sequence, there's no chemical attraction like that. You can spell cat or you can spell hat or you can spell whatever you want with those, those letter sequences like that. Um, let's see. Now a living cell is a coordinated set of non-living molecules. A protein itself is not alive, okay? protein is just a molecule. It's the compl complex interaction, all the stuff going on inside, working together, coordinated and structured like this, that causes, that, that says it's alive, right? That, 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 it's, that it's life like that. The ability to grow and to react and reproduce, uh, none of this is derived from the special properties of these molecules, but rather from the organization of the cell itself. It's not the kind of organization that you see in snowflakes. It's the only uh, resulting from some sort of deliberate design or creation, I should say. Okay, now, this is a big deal right here. This is, this is uh, how the, this is the messenger RNA. Remember, this is half that chain of that DNA ladder right here. So uh, starting over here is a uh, gene sequence. This is a gene in your body, you know, about the genome sequence and so forth. Each one of these three things are together is a codon. These are all amino acids down through here. Or just not amino acids, but nucleotides down here, the alphabet. And there's this little protein worker called a messenger RNA, or that's what this whole thing is. There's this little protein worker called a transfer RNA that sits on top of this thing. It's actually called a ribosome as well. And it acts like a reading head of a tape recorder. And it kind of feels the shapes that are below it. And it says, oh, I need a uh, aniline, uh, you know, um, amino acid. And so it goes and finds one of those and sticks it on there. And it feels what the next one should be. And it'll, it'll so it moves along uh, over here. And so it says, well, the first one was a start code. And then it needs a proline, an aspinine next. It's kind of like, you know, this one, proline's at bat aspinine's on deck, you know, and, and start right here is on first base. And so as it moves along, uh, it keeps building this chain uh, like this, got one on deck at all times. And so it's moving along three at a time. This head's reading the leonine, this head's reading the aniline, and so it keeps pulling them together and doing this. Now, I've got a little video that I found today uh, that I really think does a good job of describing this. Um, it takes about uh, two and a half minutes or so. So I'm gonna show you that now. Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called the nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. 
This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein. Key to learning is repetition, so I wanted to show you that twice by that, by that video right there. Now, let's go back to Aaron. Okay, that, you, by the way, they've got all sorts of animations uh, at www.maxanim.com, just like that. On, on the, I was amazed at what all they had out there. McGraw-Hill puts those things together. Um, now, by the way, a protein chain can be anywhere between 400 amino acids long or a couple of thousand amino acids long. And it takes anywhere between 20 seconds and maybe 45 seconds to build one of those proteins. It all goes really fast. And so it just zips along and boom, there's your, your, there's your protein. And of course, it's steady building proteins because your body's breaking down all the time and constantly needs to build uh, new proteins out there. Um, now, this. I really put this out here just to demonstrate to you chemically these proteins molecules have certain geometric shapes to them. Notice how they use things like there's a 122 degree angle between this strut, between this nitrogen atom, the carbon atom on this side, the nitrogen atom and the carbon atom on this side. 122 degrees, it'll always be that way. Chemically, it says it's got to work that way. And uh, 111 degrees between these two, 118 degrees, and they know it exactly uh, how this thing's going to be shaped like this. And so there is a particular shape uh, to the molecules. There's a geometric structure uh, that I should say. The angles are determined by the laws of chemistry and by the electromagnetic and strong and weak nuclear forces that are in the atoms uh, themselves. And once you put together an amino acid molecule, parts of this amino acid can swivel. Notice it's swiveling over here. Now, parts of it are rigid structure because there's triangles and so forth that, that hold it all together. But there's one little part of it that allows this amino acid part of it to swivel like this, kind of like a hinge. And uh, that's going to play a very important role. Uh, there's two parts, uh, this part down here and this part over here. Each amino acid has a slightly different spot where they swivel like this. And proteins have this three-dimensional shape down here. Now, they start out as just a chain of amino acids about right here. And then they can fold up either into a pleated sheet, okay? or an alpha helix. Uh, that's the secondary structure that it goes into. And once it's in uh, that structure, it can fold up again into the third or tertiary protein structure and make something that looks like this right here. And then finally, it can fold up and pair up with other proteins to, that fit together into the grooves and so forth and uh, build the actual structure. And so these proteins, the, the function follows the form. In other words, if you want to build a doorknob, you got to build it in a way that, 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 that it works, you know, that function follows form, okay? You wouldn't build a doorknob uh, in any way except kind of what we see here. Uh, same thing, once you build a protein in a particular pattern and way, it works for what it's designed to do because of its shape, because of its form, uh, gives it its function right there. Um, here's a, a picture of a protein uh, in its native state all folded up like this and then when you unfold it out like this, stretch it out, it looks like this in the unfolded state. 
But then there's an intermediate state that it can fold into, and it's got a little hinge right here, and it's a trapped state. And this little protein can go grab molecules, like an oxygen molecule, and hold it for a while as it moves over to another part of the body and release it for someplace else. And so these proteins act as little trucks and so forth. I mean, they have all kinds of functions uh, for these proteins. And so proteins are amazing little uh, devices that our body uses. The proteins themselves aren't alive, but the, the working of them together uh, specifies how all of that life and, and uh, cellular uh, works. Um, there's an example of a folded up protein, a computer generated the picture. The, one of the big things they're doing today after they've discovered the genome sequence, they're really kind of using computers to figure out or predict what kind of protein is produced by a given gene and what it might be used for. So they're using computers to try to model uh, the folding of these proteins. They've got huge Cray computers trying to figure this stuff out now. Um, and so you see this protein with a, a stretched out, I mean, some of them work like rods, other ones work like a, um, sheets, pleated sheets. You can think, compare that to, to two befores and plywood, okay? Uh, you can build anything with a combination of two befores and plywood and so forth. And same thing with proteins. All the little twists and turns and helices and grooves and crevices come into complex folds. And as because those uh, amino, amino acids have swivel joints on parts of it, a whole structure like this may have a hinge, you know, uh, and uh, you get put onto it or hinge in multiple different places. Now, let's, let's examine real quickly or briefly how the Darwinian idea of evolution fits into this uh, uh, going on right here. Uh, supposedly, Darwin said that, that there were random mutations going on and that some of these mutations would be beneficial, right? And the beneficial ones would be selected out by natural selection and preserved through their offspring. And this presupposes, though, some sort of reproduction going on. So you've got to have life going on at the same time. And when you say beneficial, if you're talking about non-life evolving into the first cell, beneficial to what? I mean, it's not alive yet. There's no benefit to a non-living matter. A rock doesn't care whether it's, you know, big or little or, or, or shaped whatever way. There's no benefit to a rock and, uh, or a, a you know, mass of non-living uh, uh, goo in the, in the ocean. There's no benefit to that. So. Uh, it presupposes life already in the process. And of course, a, muta uh, a mutation is a mistake in the copying process. And um, mistakes would, a mistake in the protein structure would mean that it no longer functions as it's supposed to. And uh, that's how mutations uh, harm uh, people today, uh, because of the mistakes in that structure. Radiation uh, can cause uh, uh, mistakes like that to occur. Uh, but we want to try to get life uh, started here. And there was an experiment, or a hypothesis, I should say, that they came up with because evolutionists have this problem, okay? They, they, they realize, well, we can explain once life gets started how it evolves, okay? Because they've got the whole Darwinian evolution thing. But how does it get started in the first place, okay? And they've got this theory called the Oparin Haldane hypothesis. And they suppose that billions of years ago that there was this reducing atmosphere, that's an atmosphere without oxygen, by the way, that's what that means, of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen and water vapor, and that there was lightning all around, uh, organic molecules were being formed, the amino acids were being formed, and the amino acids were just randomly joining together, making proteins, you know, uh, polypeptide chains out here, uh, all in this soup out here, this prebiotic soup, and uh, they supposed that eventually they turned into RNA-like nucleotides, and uh, eventually clumps of it would uh, coacervate together and come into the first prototype cells. And this, this is all going on in their mind. They don't have any diagram for how all this works. They just imagine this stuff as if it's a science fiction story. Now here, there's the picture of the primordial seas and the lightning and all that kind of stuff, and here's the goo close up right there, so you can, you can see all that, appreciate that. And um, then back in the 1950s, 1953 that is, a couple of scientists named Miller and Ure did an experiment. They were trying to determine whether or not you could make amino acids out of that reducing atmosphere and the methane 
ammonia, hydrogen, and so forth. Uh, and they were uh, they needed to um, make a spark to, to to look like lightning. So they came up with this flask down here of this soup of, of prebiotic stuff, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen, and uh, put a little flame under it and got it boiling up, coming around here, going into this gas chamber right here, and they caused a an electric spark to, to go on like that, and uh, it burned uh, some of the uh, uh, materials that were floating around here, some of the gas like this, and then they condensed the gas and let it fall down into the bottom here and collect at the bottom right there, and they found, um, they were hoping to find amino acids, because amino acids are made up of the same stuff that they've got <coughs> boiling around down here. And the first time they ran this experiment, it was a complete failure. Basically, it was a uh, a bunch of tar uh, at the bottom, but it, it, it really didn't, uh, actually that wasn't the first time. The first time they ran the experiment, they didn't get anything. And that's when they figured out they needed to put a trap in here to trap it, okay? I'll tell you more about that trap in just a minute right here, but that kind of prevents the annihilation because once the trap got in here, it would boil up again and all the amino acids would be destroyed. Uh, so they built this trap and, and the, uh, the second time they ran this experiment, about 85% of what they got down here, of the, the matter that they were looking for, was tar, okay? Just burned up kind of tar matter. The same stuff you get in the bottom of your oven when your apple pie runs over, okay? Um, and and uh, of the remaining 15%, they got some carbon-based molecules because they got, they got the right stuff in here and they've got a spark going here. But 98% of that 15% was just junk and about 2% of it was actually amino acids. And of the 2%, see I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller here, of the 2% of the 98% of the 15% that was uh, uh, out there uh, was glycine, only one amino acid. And so, uh, and then if they introduced oxygen into this, by the way, it all got burned up and nothing, nothing was produced right there uh, because the oxygen is what caused the burning and everything. Now, by the way, what do you need for life? oxygen. So if you got any oxygen in the whole experiment fails right there. So they had to remove the oxygen in order to make it work and they had to put the trap in there. And that sounds like intelligent design right there on the experiment going like that. Uh, eventually they did, they were able to uh, produce a few of the amino acids and so forth. Uh, but ultimately it was a forlorn hope and, and a failure. Uh, but they still uh, refer to this experiment because that, you know, in the prebiotic soup we can create amino acids. And they're wanting these amino acids to kind of by themselves join together and form proteins, okay? Without any of that fancy stuff you saw going on in that movie right there. They just want them to just kind of hook up and, and, and make, a, make a protein. And the proteins kind of hook up and make, you know, all the stuff that's, that's needed for that. And the DNA to just kind of hook up and accident, you know, come together. But now, um, in this experiment, they have yet no proteins, no DNA or RNA and no cell membranes or anything like that that you would need. And so uh, the results do not uh, speak well uh, for that. And this is such an embarrassment and a big problem to so many different scientists that they've resorted to fantastic ideas to explain the origin of life. Now, th this looks like science fiction novels, but Francis Crick right here wrote this no uh, a book, I was trying to say novel, uh, wrote this book called Life itself, its origin and nature. Now, by the way, do you know who Francis Crick was? He was one of the co-discoverers of DNA, okay? He's got the Nobel Peace Prize and all that kind of stuff. He said that they came from outer space, that somehow or another life itself came from outer space and landed on the earth, and that was the start of life, that uh, these uh, um, life forms. And of course, that just pushes the problem back. And he figured, well, if we can never get to those other planets, then we'll figure it out, <laughs> which kind of gives him a safe, safe way to go right there. Fred Hoyle, uh, another genius scientist right here, he's the one that coined the term Big Bang, by the way. So he was a respected uh, scientist and so forth. What's the name? Diseases from space. He was so upset with the idea of Darwinian evolution and, and getting life started and all that kind of stuff. He said, well, he agreed. It had to come from out of space out there. So a couple of uh, uh, respected scientists uh, saying that we don't know how it happened. It couldn't happen on this earth. There's no explanation. And so therefore they resort to uh, crazy stories like outer space uh, coming down. Now, Ure was, remember here, the Miller-Ure experiment? He was the one that did that little flask experiment and so forth. He said, 
All of us who study the origin of life find that the more we look into it, the more we feel it is too complex to have evolved anywhere. We all believe, as an article of faith, that life evolved from dead matter on this planet. It's just that its complexity is so great, it's hard to imagine that it did. And so there is another honest moment from a scientist. Uh, we saw the quotes that were kind of running when we all came in, uh, kind of same kind of thing right there. If you catch them in their uh, frank moments, they will, will, will tell you what they really think. But the whole point of this evening is to uh, compute the probability to be an odds maker on how this could have got started by chance. Um, it's the most significant problem for evolution, even more so than the idea of intelligent design or irreducible complexity, I think. Um, but we've got to review some math, okay? There's a whole science or whole branch of mathematics that deal with probability, uh, computing odds and chances and so forth. Now, what are the, what's the probability if I flip a coin that I get heads, okay, one and two, because it could be heads and tails. If I flip it, I've got a 50-50 chance that it's going to come out to be, be heads, right? Well, what's the chance of flipping a coin twice and getting heads both times? Okay, that's a little bit different computation right there. It's not uh, all of a sudden, uh, it's not, uh, uh, you know, you can just add one like that. Uh, but we get all these different combinations. So let's hear the coins right here. I can get a heads or a tails, or a tails and a heads, or a tails and a tails, or a heads and a heads. And so there's four different ways it can come out, all right? And those are the only four possibilities it can have. So it's a one out of four chance of flipping a coin twice. And the way the formulas work out on that, uh, mathematically, uh, uh, it's two raised to the two power equals four, um, where uh, here's an explanation of it. The yellow number here, this two, represents how many times you flip it, and the green two represents the number of possible outcomes for a single flip, heads or tails, right here. So two raised to the to the two power, because I've got to get it twice in a row right here, and that equals four. Two times two is four. Okay, so there's our first lesson in mathematics. Now let's go a little bit more advanced right here. What's the chance of flipping a coin three times and getting heads every time? Okay, here's the only one with heads, all three in a row right here. So that's one out of Eight, yeah. Now here's the, how the math on that works. Two raised to the third power, two times two times two, make eight, okay? So one out of eight is the chance of, of that. So I mean, you, you're now starting to get into the basics and you pretty much figure out uh, anything by, by knowing uh, this little bit right here on probability. Now, what is the chance of flipping a coin 10 times and getting all heads? Every, every 10 times in a row. Well, taking our formula, you know, one out of two for a single flip, so two raised to the 10th power, because we're gonna flip it 10 times in a row, two times, two times, two to 10 times is 1,024, okay? Round that off to the nearest thousand right here, so that's one out of 1,000, or one out of 10 raised to the third power, 1,000 is one followed by three zeros, that's 10 raised to the third power. So that's the way we're gonna start thinking in terms of bigger numbers, because we're fixing to get some real big numbers here, and we gotta express it in scientific notation right here. So 10 raised to the third power is the odds of getting flipping a coin 10 times in a row and getting all heads. And that's not very good odds of doing that. You wouldn't expect to get 10 heads in a row right there. But maybe it's possible. I mean, you do it enough times, maybe, maybe, maybe it'll happen. Okay, now we're gonna calculate the probability of life, right? Uh, that's too complex. Let's, let's, let's reduce the problem down a little bit. Let's calculate how about a single cell, how, you know, the chance of getting a single cell. Yeah, that's, that's too much. It's too complex going on in that cell. How about just a single strand of DNA, you know, of a human or something like that? No, there's a whole lots of genes in a single DNA. We, we just, we need to boil it down even simpler than that. How about a single protein? Let's compute the odds of getting a single protein. Well, a typical protein's got 2,000 amino acids in it. So that's a lot of amino acids. And can't we just get it down a little bit? Well, it turns out there's a, something called an enzyme, which is a, also a protein, but it's a smaller protein used for special purposes. And it only has about 200, a typical enzyme may only contain 200 different amino acids. So I like the enzyme. We'll, we'll compute the odds of getting a single enzyme from this prebiotic soup out there of amino acids right here. So our goal is to create one small enzyme. 
Now, in the natural world, there are about 80 to 100 amino, different amino acids out there. And of that 80 or so amino acids, only 20 of them are used for life. Only 20 of them are bioactive, they call it. But they come in left-handed and right-handed varieties, okay? Interestingly enough, life only has left-handed amino acids. All the right-handed ones, which there's an equal number of them out there in the natural world, uh, they can, they, or the, as far as molecules are concerned, all the right-handed ones, if there's any right-handed ones, I should say, in there, it's fatal to, to the animal, to, the, to whatever critter is out there. So no right-handed uh, amino acids can be used for life. So that's the rules we've got to play by right here, because that's what we discover uh, in life. So let's assume that we have all the amino acids we need, big old bowl of them, okay, and we can reach in and pick out the right one, put it on a chain right here, pick out another one, put it on the chain. We gotta do it 200 times, I mean, yeah, 200 times in a row, picking 200 of them out, and we gotta specify a single enzyme. Now, we can't just pick them out in any order. They gotta be a specific order, right? Because each three of those amino acids in a row, well, excuse me, the way they fold up, I'm thinking nucleotides, scratch that. The way they fold up specifies that protein's function, right? And if it's the wrong order, you get the wrong protein. And, and we want a particular enzyme that will do something for us. So, uh, we want 200 amino acids in a specific order. And we need, the first one's got to be a 1 in 20 chance. In other words, there's only 20 of them that are bioactive. So, 1 in 20. But... You know, to string together a right amino acid or a right uh, protein chain, I can start at the one end or the other. I, I don't care. Just start at either end. So that reduces the whole thing in half. So let's call it 1 in 10 because we can go either direction on this thing. So start out with an odds of 1 in 10. And um, we got to get them in the right sequence, okay? we got to get all 200 in a row. Now that, by the way, is 1 in 10 to the 200th power because we've got to do it 200 times. Remember when you, the number of times you flip that coin is the exponent, so there's the exponent right there, 200 times, so we've got to increase this odds by 1 in 10 to the 200th power, chance of the right sequence. And we've got to get all left-handed ones right. That's a 50-50 chance. And so uh, the odds of picking 200 left-handed amino acids uh, all, in the, uh, all together at the same time is one raised to the ten, or one in ten raised to the sixtieth power. Uh, I can show you the math on that, but 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 trust me, I've checked it a couple of times here. One in, uh, one in ten to the sixtieth power chance of all left-handed. And remember, there's only uh, there's eighty possible amino acids or so, uh, but I've got to get only twenty of those eighty. So that's a you know one out of every four, but I got to do it two hundred times in a row. So that's one in 10 to the 120th power uh, chance of being bioactive, one of the bioactive uh, enzymes or pro uh, amino acids that is. Now, how do you put all these together? Because all this to put goes together to make a single chance. Well, you multiply uh, these numbers together to get the total odds on this thing. And the way you multiply uh, numbers with exponents is you add the exponents down here. So we add them up, one in 10 to the 200 times 10 to the 60th times 10 to the 120th power. Add the 200 plus 60 plus 120, and that gives you an answer of 1 in 10 raised to the 380th power. Chance of getting a single enzyme on there. Now, that's a pretty big number, uh, but let me explain to you the significance of a zero, because some of you, you well, let me illustrate it. Uh, I'm going to hire some people, okay, and I'm going to pay them $500 a week. So some of you need a job, $500 a week. That's what I'm going to pay you. I know you're worth more than that, but that's, that's what I'm paying. Now, so you work a week, and I write you your first paycheck. But I'm, I'm real busy, and so I, I forget to put a zero in there. So I write five zero instead of five zero zero, okay? Now, would you be happy with $50 instead of 500 See, that's just a zero, you know, but I'll tell you, well, just live on that for a week, and, you know, we'll, we'll make it up next week. And so the next week, I'll give you an extra zero, right? So I'll put five, zero, zero, zero to give you that extra zero right there. And now we're even, right? You like that, don't you? That'd be something to write home to mama about. <laughs> $5,000, right? 
Now, what if I put two zeros on there? Now you're talking, you know, $50,000, okay? So, I mean, it, uh, a zero makes a big difference. It's a single zero right here. Now, so here, uh, here's the number. One, drum roll, boom. That's a lot of zeros right there. And so one out of, I can't pronounce that number. <laughs> okay, now let me give you some comparisons here because you, you, again, you understand the significance of the difference between $50 and $500 and $500 and $5,000, but you really don't have a feeling for what, what this is right here. Do you know how many seconds there are in 15 billion years, which is the length of time the universe is supposed to have existed? 10 to the 18th seconds. That's that many zeros right here. In supposedly 15 billion years, that's how many seconds there are, okay? Uh, gives you kind of a feel for it. By the way, how many particles are there in the entire universe? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how they figure this stuff out. I guess you use the back of the napkin approach, but they know about how many galaxies and stars in each galaxy and planets in each one. Uh, particles, meaning atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, all that kind of stuff. Uh, 10 to the 80th power. So there's 80 zeros, okay? That's the number of particles in the entire universe, okay? And look how big we got to go right here as far as the number right there. So that's the chances of getting a single enzyme right here. Now, let's, let's do some more work on that. I need to make some corrections. And so, because uh, you, you, you may argue, you may say, well, that's the odds of computing a particular enzyme. But there's 2,000 known enzymes out there, okay? So, uh, what, you know, why hold me to a particular one? Let's go with any one of the 2,000 out there. I said, okay, that's fine. How about a million? I'll let you pick one out of a million possible enzymes out there. So, I'll give you that. Well, that's only six zeros. So, we take off six zeros for one out of a million. So, satisfied you there, right? No, we still got a long way to go here before. By the way, scientists say that any odds greater than one out of 10 to the 50th is impossible. That's the pure definition of impossibility. So we, we still got, we got a long way to go before we get into the realm of possibility down here. Uh, and so you, you say again, well, but uh, you know what? You're, you're only doing an experiment in one location at one particular time. We got to try it over and over again, right? And we got to do it in multiple places all over the planet and everything. So, okay, that's fine. Well, we're here, I'll tell you what, we'll, excuse me, it's got static or something like that. We'll cover the entire earth with chemicals of amino acids, okay? We'll just dump it all out there on there, four miles thick. I'll give you an ocean made out of nothing but amino acids, four miles thick, covering the entire earth. And we'll let you build little tiny back, uh, laboratories to do each one of these experiments the size of a bacteria. And you can put those laboratories, as many of them as you want, within that four miles thick of water and we'll let you cover that. Now, how many laboratories would that be? Well, that'd be about five times 10 to the 36th power. But you say, oh, but we gotta do it over and over again, All right? Okay, that's fine. There's a billion years that life is supposed to have evolved over this earth, so I'll give you the whole billion years over and over again. I'll let you do it once a minute. And remember, it normally takes about uh, 20 minutes to make an enzyme. I don't know if I told you that, but normally it takes about 20 minutes to make an enzyme right there. Um, um, but I'm wrong on that. It takes about 20 seconds. But anyway, forget that. But I'm once a minute for a billion years, okay, in four miles thick, little laboratories the size of bacteria covering the entire planet. Uh, so that's a lot of experiments right there. That's five times 10 to the phrase to the 14th power times five times 10 to the 36th power. That's 51 zeros, that's a lot of zeros right there. That should have, should have gone, there it is, 51 zeros. So yeah, we're, we're making some progress here. Uh, but you say, well, I mean, that's just the Earth though. Could be other planets going on, right? I mean, Fred Hoyle said it came from outer space, so let's, let's try some other planets. Like, okay, 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 we'll, we'll give you some, some of those too. Now, let's assume the universe is made up of galaxies edge to edge. Now, we know there's a lot of empty space out there, and it's a long way from one galaxy to the next, but I'll just give you this. Galaxies edge to edge, no space between the galaxies. And in each galaxy, there's 100 billion stars, and on each star's solar system, there's a planet capable of life, able to support life. What does that do to the figure, if I give you all those places to do that? Well, that adds another... Uh, 
29 zeros to the problem. You see, I mean, we're just not going to get there, are we? Uh, and they know this, uh, but here's their story. A fellow by the name of George Wald said, Time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. One only has to wait. Time itself performs all the miracles. And Charles Darwin said, time, unimaginable tracks of time is the key. And so uh, they depend on this time. So you say, all right, you need some more time? I'll give you some time. We, how, many, how much time did I give you already? A billion years, is that what we get? Let's do 20 billion years. How many zeros does that take off? It add to take off of it? One zero. Because <laughs> it's an order of magnitude difference, right? Exactly. Good, good answer right there. A trillion years would be just two more zeros uh, right there. And so, uh, will enough time solve the problem? Will enough time be the hero? Is that the key, unimaginable tracks of time? But what about everything else that's needed? So you got to have thousands of proteins. you got to have the DNA. And uh, once you throw all that into the factor, I mean, that raises the problem to about 13 million zeros after that one right there. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, and of course, you'd need a selectively permeable membrane for the cell wall, right? I mean, those are some interesting things going on, the osmosis and everything going from outside the cell to the inside of the cell and all that communication going on. So uh, 13 million zeros additional and a selectively permeable membrane. Now, there's a mosquito. Okay, if I got a mosquito on my arm, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna slap it, right? Okay, now, uh, what's the difference between the mosquito before and the mosquito after I slapped it? He's dead, right? He's dead. Now, but why is it dead? He's squashed, right? The same thing as saying I disorganized that mosquito, right? <laughs> He's no longer this complex, organized bit of matter right there. He's all been disorganized. Uh, I hate to bring this up, but it'd be the same thing as taking a blender and putting a mouse inside and spinning them all up, okay? I mean, gruesome thought, but uh, you got all the parts for life in there, right? You got all the amino acids, you got all the, the, the proteins, you got everything you need. Could life just by chance start from that slapped mosquito right there? No. Well, I mean, let's take it even a step further. What if, Lord forbid, one of us had a heart attack and died all of a sudden right there laying on the ground? One minute alive, next minute dead. Well, what's the difference? A spark of life, something that only God gives, right? And uh, the scientists can't uh, figure that. How could anyone believe in a chance God? Well, you ever read Alice in Wonderland? Uh, I think it was the Red Queen trying to convince Alice uh, that she could believe in possible things. And Alice said, there's no use in trying. One can't believe in possible things. And the queen says, I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Lewis Carroll. Um, I think that's what they do, okay? Uh, because it's a, remember one of, the, one of those quotes was it was a faith-based system. It's a matter of faith, an article of faith that they believe for these things. Of course, God told us in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I think that's the bottom line, truth of the matter right there. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the awesome creation that we see. Thank you for the beautiful sunset we saw this evening. We ask you to go with us to our homes now as we ponder uh, uh, your majesty and your glory and uh, bring us together. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.